Okay, cool. So uh, today's speaker is Sing Yen, who is the president of NUS Sector, and he'll be conducting today's workshop. So Sing Yen, over to you. Uh, thanks, Asim. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I see we have the largely the same participants. So I'll just do a quick intro again. Um, this is an introduction to HTML and CSS. So if you are already somewhat experienced in both of these technologies, you might uh, not find this workshop so engaging. So if you think it's not the right workshop for you, uh, yeah, you, you, you can leave if you decide it's not that helpful to you. Uh, no, no feelings hurt here. Uh, if not, I hope uh, you learn, pick up something from this workshop. I hope it's useful to you. And with that, uh, I'm going to get started. So um, typically, uh, I used to conduct this workshop in, um, I, I would ask participants to start their own browser and their own favorite code editor, but I'm trying out some, oh wait, how could I forget? Uh, I'm gonna say, share the, I'm gonna share the links to the slides in the chat. So you, if you are the kind who likes to read ahead or, <clears throat> or skim through, uh, you have the option to do so. Yeah, so as in, uh, the, is the link in the chat? Yeah, the link. Okay, great. Yeah, so if you're the kind who likes to browse through the slides first, uh, yeah, feel free to do so. And also uh, the reason why I'm sharing the slides is because there are several links inside here that I think it might be useful for you. So you can click on them and they'll open in a pop-up. So not a pop-up. That they're open, they will open up. So yeah, back to the slides. So typically I conducted uh, them uh, in vanilla. So you would have to bring your own browser and bring your own code editor. This time I'm trying out something new. Uh, code Sandbox is this service where they provide a online coding environment suited for web development. So if you open a link, it should lead you to like the website. So you don't actually need an account. What you can do is you go to code sandbox and you click on create a sandbox. So they should ask you for what kind of options you want. Uh, click on create sandbox. You don't need to sign in and create account for the, this workshop. You can simply choose a static template over here with the five, which is the HTML5 logo and it should set up a simple sandbox for you. So let's reset the zoom. Um, I'll quickly go through uh, what this sandbox offers. Um, to the left, you have this panel. Uh, you have a, a bunch of other options here, but we are not going to use any of them today. We will just be dealing with a file explorer. So you have a bunch of files here. Uh, we'll only be concerned with like HTML and CSS files. Uh, you can pretty much ignore these two. If you are participating in the work React workshop next week, we will probably touch them, but that's not within the scope of today's workshop. So you have files here that you can access. Uh, it can, comes with an uh, index of HTML, which I'll explain why it is later. You have an editor here where you can edit things and um, it works like a normal editor. So when you press Control S, it will open. It, uh, it, yeah, it will, it will save. And to the right here, you have a, you have a, what looks like a mini browser. And in fact, it does function as a mini browser. So when you save, when you make modifications to a file here and you save it, it will actually update here. So that's all the features that we'll be dealing with with Code Sandbox for today. So uh, yeah, if you would like to follow along as you, uh, as you go through this workshop, uh, feel free to go to Code Sandbox now and start up your own sandbox. Uh, I will, well, I think one, one or two minutes is fine for this. So if there's any problems, uh, I'm looking at the chat and then I'll, I, I think I can help you out for a minute or so. It, yeah. So we'll go ahead at ten ten.
So if anyone has any issues, but and feel free to raise them up in the chat. But uh, uh, since I don't see anything, I will assume that the setup was fine. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, yeah, just pop me in the chat or anything. Uh, yeah. So well, we are we're still using a browser, but we are no longer using your own code editor. We are using code sandbox. So that's that. Okay, now when you get started on working with HTML and CSS and really like pretty much anything on the web, you will want to refer to documentation and it's no longer as maintained as it was back then, but the MDN web dot uh, Mozilla developer network is pretty much the go-to reference for any web developer who's looking up on something HTML and CSS related and also like JavaScript and whatnot. So uh, I have included links in the slides. So this is pretty much the comprehensive set of documentations for uh, anything web related. Uh, I probably will be referencing this a lot later if I've forgotten anything. Yeah, so we'll get to see a lot of this later. Um, there is also this, uh, I don't think people typically refer to it, but this is the official HTML specification, which tells you how HTML should be. Um, I don't think most browsers follow the standard word for word. I think sometimes people, yeah, sometimes browsers insist on their own way of doing things and there's a bunch of drama, but we are not getting into that today. Yeah. Okay, so what is HTML? Uh, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So it, it was a, it's a markup language. It was designed to like markup documents. Uh, so back, back a long time ago, say like 1990, when the internet was first getting started, they needed some kind of um, way to just markup documents and then uh, share it over the internet. So they came up with HTML. And back then it was pretty simple, but uh, as, as, we, as the internet developed, uh, the, the need for richer content, like richer interactive content, like for example, videos, audio, uh, canvases, and, and other things pop up because they realized, hey, we could do all these things on the web. And HTML got uh, more, well, a, a slightly added more features. So we, so, Eventually, at some point, they decided let's stop increasing the standard number. So we are currently at HTML5, but we have been in HTML5 for a long time. So that's that. So that is what HTML is. So uh, HTML is what forms like your web pages. So uh, my slides are actually a web page now. Uh, oh, I see some things in the chat. Okay, uh, yeah, that's the links to the code sandbox. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Pratan. Yeah, so uh, this is an example of a web page. This is our NUS Hackers website. And what I mentioned, right, that HTML is uh, what is displaying all this content underneath. So uh, if you right click on a web, any web page, like for example, this, and you select something like view source. Uh, it might be a different setting on your browser. Like for mine, it's view page source. It should show you something like this. And you can see that. So this is your HTML document. I'll be going to this structure really soon. And this is the HTML for the previous page. Yep. Okay, now let's get started. So we have a link. Uh, to a very simple HTML page. You can open it if you have the links to the slides. If not, uh, I can drop them in the chat again if you just join. So we have a really simple page here, which just has one line. So let's break down the contents of this page. Uh, this. Okay, so this is the con this is the contents of the HTML document, which you would be able to see as well if you right click and view source. I'm just going to stick to the slides and explain what it is. So at the start we have a dot type declaration. So what this 
is saying is that this file is a HTML document. So uh, there are other documents types that are supported. Uh, well, back to MDN. Um, this is a page on, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, your browser supports other doc types, but the TLDR is, there's a lot of legacy on the web. So to prevent your browser from switching into like works mode, you will pretty much always have like this uh, declaration exclamation mark doc type HTML on top of every uh, modern HTML page these days. Uh, you, yeah, feel free to read this in more detail if you're interested in like all these things, like for example, what quirks mode is, because yeah, there's a lot of, lot of legacy to the web. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so after doc type, we have this um, HTML element. Uh, this things which start with like this uh, less than sign and end with a greater sign, these are called like tags and you have opening and closing text and they form an element. Uh, so this particular element, HTML, is uh, the declaration of all your HTML content. So let's go a step further. We see that inside this HTML element, we have two things. Uh, we have two other elements actually. One of them is a head element and the other is a body element. So, um, let me explain a little bit more. Uh, as I mentioned, this forms a tag, right? So this is the opening tag, and the other one is the closing tag. So you uh, most of this most of the time, if you look at other documents, say something more complex like this, you will pretty much see that every a lot of things come with an opening tag and a corresponding closing tag. So like for example, this DT and uh, it has a corresponding closing DT tag. Uh, this div this, uh, yeah. Uh, yep. So these are uh, they pretty much come in pairs. Uh, you can have self closing text later. I'll cover them later when we talk about images and whatnot. But uh, now let's talk about what the head tag is. So the head tag doesn't actually get displayed in the page directly. Uh, you might have you might have inferred it from this. Uh, but what it does is it contains a lot of page metadata, like for example, your title. So as an example, um, you can see, well, this particular tab, right? it has uh, a title here inside of my tab, uh, HTML colon hypertext markup language. So if we were to view the page source of this particular page, we would probably see somewhere a title tag. Okay, it's very poorly formatted, but you can see a title tag here that says HTML hypertext markup language bar MDN. So uh, there is a whole bunch of other things in this, this particular page. And, uh, this is a very bad example. Let's see if there's something in there. Let's see my own page. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I have a bunch of other things. I have my title. Uh, I have a bunch of links here um, that are including style sheets. We'll go through them later. And, uh, I have some metadata, which uh, in this example, it specifies the character set for this document uh, in a viewport and whatnot. So yeah, uh, of course, these things are not getting displayed directly inside my browser, in my document here, in my, my document here, but they contain a lot of metadata and whatnot. So that's what the head is for. And the body is what contains the contents. So as an example, well, not as an example, right? Inside, inside this particular page, this is very, this is the content of this particular uh, for, for simple page.html. Yeah, so uh, in this example, because it's a simple one, we only have some text. So it just displays the text as it is, as it is. But of course, that's not the point of HTML. We want to create more complex documents. So let's go through um, this particular document first. Uh, you can see the three dots. We have uh, the horizontal ellipsis here. Now, if you 
look at it. Now, if you try to highlight it, uh, let's not do that yet. If you try to highlight it, you'll realize that it's actually three dots together. It's not like I type like dot dot. Uh, it's not like I type dot dot dot. So it's actually a single entity. So uh, what what uh, in HTML you have things called entities uh, that begin with an M percent and end with a semicolon. So it's for you to display special characters because sometimes uh, you need you you need these characters for some other purposes. Like for example, like look at these HTML uh, elements and these tags. Right? Text begin with this uh, smaller than and greater than something. So if you wanted to say use signs like this inside your document, how would your browser know uh, that you're trying to use it as a sign? Uh, use it as an use it for your content and not just like to open or close a uh, the start of the tag instead, right? So you to work around this, you need HTML entities. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, these are the wrong links. Well, the, the HTML spec uh, covers all of this. It's taking a while to okay, yeah, it's taking a while to load. So yeah, so these are several entities. Uh, well, not just several, a whole bunch actually. Yeah. So that's that. Okay, but yeah, as we mentioned, right, this is a very simple page. We that's not the point of this workshop. So let's <coughs> sorry, explore more elements and see like what else we can do. So um we could start off by modding the HTML page directly, or if you want, you could copy the contents of this page into a code sandbox. So I'm gonna try doing that. So you could view your page source, uh, right click view page source it gives you the page source for this simple page and we're going over to code sandbox in index.html and just overwriting everything there and then when we save the browser to the right should update so alternatively if you would like to modify this page in line which i think i'm, I'm planning to go through because if you are going to do html itself you will probably want to learn about the document inspector anyway so for the document inspector, uh, this is something that um, allows you to inspect the properties of your page. So I'll quickly go through it uh, here. For my browser, I'm using Firefox. So uh, what I can do is to press uh, F12, which should pop up this uh, uh, inspector. Well, uh, this, this entire thing is called the developer console. Uh, for this workshop, we'll mostly be using the inspector. Um, yeah, we wouldn't even be using the style editor, I think, even though we'll be going to the CSS. Let me just quickly cover um, the rest of these as well, because even though we are not going to be using them, if you are doing any form of web development, they might come in helpful. So this thing is a console where if you are running JavaScript, you will you, you can use this to run a bunch of JavaScript on your page. Uh, this is a debugger that's helpful for debugging your JavaScript. Uh, this thing shows your network request because, well, uh, HTML is typically served over the internet, right? So you can see like what network requests were performed. Um, I did not mean to do that. Um, this is a style editor. I think I think this is only for Firefox. Uh, it allows you to edit like style sheets in line. We'll go into style sheets later. This is for performance tuning. This is for viewing memory. This is for viewing uh, things that are stored in a browser. And this is for making sure your web well, debugging like the accessibility of your page. Um, uh, I'm just not going into this tab. So you have several options. Um, I usually, you, you, you can adjust this um, developer console. Um, you can dock it, you can move it to a new separate window. For the duration of this workshop, I'm going to keep it docked to the bottom. So yeah, that's a quick run through of the document inspector. Um, so, you, you can do everything in code sandbox. Um, for the purpose of this workshop, I'll um, be doing my stuff. I'll generally be doing my stuff inside the browser directly because I'm just going to be, be making simple edits. So for Firefox, we have a, sorry, give me a moment. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So, um, 
in Firefox, the developer tools should come with. Okay, let me zoom in a little. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I hope it's easier to see for everyone. Yeah, um, your inspector tab comes with a little plus here, which says create new node. So what this does is it adds a new HTML element. So if I undo, well, um, clicking create new node for me adds like this diff element inside the document for me. Um, you can kind of see like my browser, well, Firefox highlighting it that there's a div there, but there's nothing displayed okay, so far. Um, so we'll add something later. Yep. So now to edit things, we can directly like double click on it and then just type something. So say I type a H1, uh, it will update into a, this element into a H1. So that's that. Okay, but now let's go through this div element first. So div is just like a, I guess a divider, right? And it doesn't really have any meaning. It, it just like, well, it, it just helps to divide your content. So along with span, it, it's like a generic tag for you to be able to dump anything inside. So in fact, a lot of pages these days, let's see, yeah, maybe this, you'll probably see a lot of this inside of that document. Uh, well, seems like there's less for this particular document, but let me see. Okay, well, let's see code sandbox. I'm guessing it probably has a lot of divs. It's horribly formatted, but let's see. Okay, code sandbox is a JavaScript app, so well, let's open the inspector instead. Okay, right, that's a lot better. Okay, so over here you can see div, 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 div. Okay, there's so many levels of divs here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's just a generic container element. Uh, oh, I didn't click undo actually. I simply <laughs> clicked on the element and I deleted it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, this is just this generic element, but if everything were to be a diff, right, it, it, it wouldn't have much meaning to them. Like the, like the whole point of HTML, as I mentioned earlier, was to mark up your content, right? So generally we try to, well, not just generally, we, we should in fact be using like specific uh, uh, elements to denote what kind of content. So uh, for example, we have other elements with semantic meaning to them. P denotes a paragraph. So for example, this in this exam, in this document, this could be a paragraph. Uh, main could contain the main content of this page. So for example, maybe in this page, this would be my main, well, including link as well. This could form my main content. Uh, article could form an entire article. Um, yeah, for example, if you're reading some news article, then like the that section of the page with the article would naturally form the article. Headers and footers. So um, maybe we could go to a more complex page like a GitHub. So um, yeah, so this portion could form my footer for GitHub. So once again, Mozilla Developer Network is here to save us. So yeah, these are like very, um, standard sections, headers, uh, a lot of things would have headers, uh, navigation bar, like for example, this would form a navigation bar, uh, yeah, uh, main sidebars, uh, this would, this portion of the page could form a natural sidebar and a footer, like as we covered earlier in GitHub page. So yeah, we, we try to give this semantic meaning. And the reason for that is because, well, number one, accessibility, right? Because not everyone on the web is, um, not everyone on the web um, yeah, um, is able to access content. Some people may, some people may be uh, vision impaired or whatnot, so they'll rely on other uh, aids to be able to browse web pages. Um, the second reason is uh, search engine optimization. 
So, well, you know how like Google has to crawl your pages, right? So how, how would Google know like what which part of your page is meaningful if everything was a div and a div and a div and a div? So by properly marking out the document, um, you, 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 you can tell like crawlers and also like um, this uh, accessibility tools, uh, which part of your page is the header, which part is the footer, which part is your main article and whatnot. Uh, where's the section, where's your navigation and whatnot. So they are properly they are able to properly uh, derive meaning from your page and whatnot. And then um, for such a thing, for well, uh, let's say web crawlers, uh, they are able to tell what part of your page is and optimize from there and whatnot. And finally, it's really semantics. You, you want to convey the type of data that is inside that particular tag. So as an, now, as an example, I briefly mentioned this earlier. Um, inside the head, we can have a title tag. Um, so this is um, the title that's shown inside the tab. So in this particular document, for I have like hacker school. Uh, this is a document on the site. Um, now, for, we can have headings as well. So uh, they are similar to the headings you have in say a Word or Google Docs document. You have six levels of headings. Um, let me see if I have an X. Yeah, so you have six levels of headings, H1, H2, up to H6. Uh, I, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have like uh, deeper levels of heading. So if you wanted to, you would probably, you might use a div and then style it using CSS to look like a, a H7 or H8 and whatnot. But for most purposes, I think H1 with H6 is adequate. Uh, we have paragraphs where it just denotes a generic paragraph. So um, similar to like paragraphs, in like real typical uh, normal English documents, um, your browser tries to insert like some spacing. Um, of course, this is just styling between paragraphs, so it is, looks like there are like two separate paragraphs. So this example, this is paragraph, this is another paragraph, um, has some spacing in between. Um, there is this element uh, br. It stands for a line. It is a line break. So what it does is it inserts. It manually inserts. A break. And so you will have some spacing between your elements. So uh, in general, you don't want to use a BR, uh, a break tag to break paragraphs because back to the, well, back to semantics, right? It, it doesn't make sense to manually break the page. So you would probably want to control style if you wanted like some spacing between paragraphs instead. Now, of course, another very generic type of element is list. Uh, we can have an UL, unordered list, uh, where they're just, by default, they display as bullets, um, or ordered list, where they have some kind of ordering to them, like first, second, third. But keep in mind that, once again, we are talking about semantics here. So even though we have all these list elements, like even though like these bullets show up, right, don't think of them at, don't think of, it has been constrained to like displaying things as bullets because uh, a lot of things naturally form this, right? Like for example, let's see what's here. Okay, like look at this navigation, right? Uh, we have several links here. And if I click on them, well, we see other links, right? And if you think about this set of links, what does it form? It's actually a list of links, right? Like we have this one, two, three. And in fact, it's an unordered list of links, right? So this could actually form like an unordered list as well. But of course you don't see like bullets over here. So once again, a reminder that at the HTML level, we are really thinking of things in terms of the content. So even though we have lists over here, uh, well, even though it doesn't look like it has bullets over here, this forms a list. And if we were developing like this list of links, we would want to, we will probably want to use an unordered, unordered list to represent like this example. Okay, and well, this is something you already know. You can have links to other pages or other sites or whatnot. So to denote a link, we use this A and anchor element. Um, in this example, we have a link to Google. So let me just go through um, how we set up a link to Google. 
So this thing inside here is called an attribute. And well, all HTML tags, well, most HTML tags support attributes. Uh, some of them support, uh, some of them have specific attributes. Like for example, href, href is, uh, is an attribute specific to anchors. So uh, let's break this down a bit further. Uh, this first part uh, before the equals is called the attribute name. And this second part is the attribute value. So in this example, this is an attribute uh, with a name of href. Uh, I think it stands for hyperlink reference, not very sure about that. But, and this href has a value of https uh, google.com. So uh, this is how you specify a link. So if you would like to try it out, you could go to say your code sandbox, for example, and add in your own anchor tag, sorry, anchor element. Like for example, a h ref equals to uh, uh, maybe I'll do like Gmail and then I close this tag with its corresponding closing tag and I have something like a link to Gmail. When I save the document, um, that's strange, it's not updating. Okay, yeah, now it's updated. I click on it and this mini browser, well, uh, somehow it's taking a while. Okay, maybe I need Uh, I think code sandbox is just ignoring it, but it should just lead you to Gmail. Uh, let me let me do that later. Yeah. Um. So that's how you set a link. But once again, um, you don't always have to put plain text inside your anchor tag. And in fact, that is the entire point of HTML. Like, look at this document. It's a rather complex document, right? We have. Uh, look at this document it's it's kind of complex right and we have like text well we have like a div inside another div we have a section inside this div we have a h1 inside this section we have a level one heading inside this section we have an image inside this section so this is actually the whole how, how the entire html document is built we have things nested inside of other text inside of other elements inside of other elements inside of other elements and all these nesting, 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 nesting forms your entire HTML document. So in this example, we, we could have a link um, to, we could have an image inside an anchor tag. Uh, well, I didn't do it in this example, but you could just place an image And then you would have an image that would also link to something else. Let's see, I don't think there are really examples here, but you, you can do that. So, and also uh, now let's talk about image while we are here. So this image is a void element. So what this means is uh, you don't actually need to close it with a corresponding closing tag. Uh, you could just have this image tag and that would be the end of it. So in this example, we have the image tag, we can have a source attribute and we just don't have a corresponding closing slash image tag. Um, some people like, well, including, well, I like to add a closing slash right here to denote that it's a self closing tag or a void element, but it's not necessary. Is it just redundant but acceptable? It's just for my own sanity. So yeah, as I was mentioning earlier, you can combine different elements to make uh, more complex things. So for example, this is an anchor and inside this anchor, we have this image, which should lead us to Google. So yeah, that's that. Okay. Uh, Let's have some time for a short exercise. So we have covered a bunch of uh, HTML elements, right? So 
uh, let's try to recreate this page. Um, well, this tiny little image, we can see we have headings, uh, we have a paragraph here, we have a little link, and we have sec uh, a section and subsections, and an unordered list and an author list. So um, if you like to follow along in Code Sandbox and give it a try, um, go ahead to Code Sandbox and edit uh, whatever is in your body tag and see if you can recreate this. Um, I'm thinking we can have five minutes for this. So at 10.45, I'll go through the solution to this exercise. Or maybe three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. So at 10.43, yeah, if you like to follow up. If not, uh, just sit back. I'll probably go through the answer a day later. Okay, uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just go through the solution quickly. So if you were following along uh, this set of slides, uh, if you have the link to this set of slides, you can actually view the answer directly by opening this link. And well, as usual, viewing the page source. So this is just an exercise. So if you're following along in, ah, okay, I miss up. So, uh, I tried recreating it over here. Um, so for the exercise one, I, I used a level one heading. I had a paragraph and inside this paragraph, I had a, I had a link to somewhere. Um, I just put my annual cycles website. Um, uh, clearly I missed out on like the second, the section one and the subsection. I went directly to the subsection. So maybe I could have used a level three heading instead, and then uh, place a section. Somewhere. So yep, that's kind of close to this exercise. So it's just a short exercise. Yeah, to create a single page and have some hands on. Now, um, you probably notice that inside Code Sandbox, uh, my font looks a little different from um, my, my browser here. Um, I will be explaining it now. Uh, so the styles, essentially the styles of this look different, right? And this has to do with the styling. Um, so to control the appearance of HTML document, we use a uh, CSS cascading style sheets. So this is just what this is just some way where some kind of uh, file or some kind of uh, language, right, that your browser under uh, is able to pass and understand, and from there uh, determine how to style your document. So we are currently at HTML. Sorry, we are currently at CSS three, and we have been there for a while. So let's dive straight into like styling. Um, 
one of the simplest ways you can do styling is by having a style attribute. So style equals, and you write uh, the properties of your styling inside there. So let's kind of break, let's quickly break this up. Um, you have something, you have this thing where it has like an attribute as well, and then a colon, and then some value terminated by a semicolon. So in this example, we have we specified that uh, for this entire paragraph, we want the color of it to be blue. And with this declaration, uh, we, we get blue text, which kind of looks like a link, but it's just styling. It's not a link, it's just blue text, right? Uh, so yeah, um, this part, this is a property. Uh, so uh, this part is a value. And between them, we have a colon and we terminate this entire thing with a semicolon. So there's a lot of such properties. Uh, common ones would be like color, um, the background. So um, say in, let's see, what's an example? Uh, here, no, okay, yeah. So uh, this, is a, this is like a table, right? So maybe the background of this cell would be a, a darker gray, and this is uh, slightly like the gray. The background of this is some dark blue. Uh, the font, the, the font, the font size, the font face, uh, whether it's serif, uh, the, the other properties, whether it's bold, italicized, and whatnot. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of fonts. I will be covering them in detail yet. Um, borders, which is the kind of border thing around. Um, yeah, I'll drop the link to the slides again here. Um, padding and margin, which I'll be going into detail very soon, I think. In fact, I'm going into detail now. So, well, for CSS, sorry, for HTML elements, uh, they kind of form a box. So let's use this. Um, oh, I forgot to cover this earlier, but when you open your developer tools, um, you have this thing that says pick an element from a page. Uh, for Firefox, it's Control Shift C or shortcut for me, I can just click on it. If you are using Chrome or some other thing, there will be some some other but some button similar uh, where you have like a rectangle and a pointer to it. So you can I'm lagging badly. You can click on it and then select some particular element. And if you go to your browser, sorry, and if you look at the inspector over here, it should have uh, selected that particular um, element on your in, inside the inspector. So now back to the box model. I mentioned that you, um, this particular element forms a box, right? And this box uh, has a bunch of other, uh, I guess, properties. So inside here, we see that our this particular H2 is about 570 pixels long and 48 pixels tall. Um, it doesn't have a border. Uh, we could click here and edit it. So let me just add like a five pixel border and you can see like I have a bar over here. Um, and we also, well, we, only, we have a margin at the bottom. So this yellow part forms a margin. Uh, we had we, uh, this line forms a border. This purple part, which isn't shown as well. Uh, well, yeah, we, in fact, we don't have any padding. Um, also takes, yeah, this forms of padding and only this blue color part is directly like the content itself. So let me cover a little, fine, I didn't have slides on that. So, uh, well, um, margins and paddings are what you expect them to be like in, in real life. So, um, well, when, say when you're writing something on some full scale paper or something, you, you could leave margins around some, uh, whatever you wrote, right? And padding is what is internal. So say you were writing on full scale paper and um, you wrote some words on like on your lines and then you had some spacing between your lines that could count as a padding. And borders could be, well, the lines themselves. So that is a base of a CSS, sorry, a HTML box model, which you can control with CSS. Okay, now jumping ahead a little, um, what if we want to apply like common styles, right? Like let's say we have, let's say, I don't know, 
um, let's say we wanted like all the paragraphs in our document to be blue color for some reason. So we could override the style tag for every single one of these elements. So we write style equals to something every single time, but um, that doesn't really, that's, that gets pretty annoying, right? So uh, what we can do instead is we have a style tag, then we override it. Like, uh, we, we have this declaration inside. And from there, all, all our paragraphs will have a blue, blue color text. So let's go into the details of this. Um, first, we have this thing, uh, which, is, which is a selector. In this example, we have a P selector. So it selects all the paragraphs. Then we have opening and closing braces. Uh, this is a declaration block. So you are probably good, you, are, not probably, you will dump all the proper, all your styling uh, properties inside here. And then uh, your entire declarations all go inside this block. So uh, we're going to do more detail in selectors later. Uh, for now, here's a quick example of some selectors. Um, adding a pound sign in front of your uh, something, uh, you know, it's the ID selector. So uh, we'll talk about IDs later. Um, dot is a class selector. And here are some like decorations, for example, well, uh, we are applying a font width. Now, um, in this example, we have a paragraph with an ID and then uh, it has, and to apply classes like grade and M, we have another attribute. So class equals to, and we are able to apply both of these classes, uh, grade and M. So this should form a, a paragraph with red text that is also bolded. So yeah, uh, here are some basic selectors. Well, we briefly covered like the ID selector, class selector. Um, this star selector selects all your elements. So it has, so basically everything in your entire document will be selected. And this uh, square bracket selects like specific attributes. So for example, you could have like a href selector. Yeah. And of course you are able to combine selectors. So for example, um, in this example, if you had like a tag and a dot class, you would want to, uh, you will be selecting a um, elements a text of a particular class, say h1 dot um, h1 dot bold. So this will only select like level one headings that are bolded. Um, for this, you will be selecting um, elements that have both of these classes. And if you join them with a comma, you'll be selecting elements that are either of class one or class two. So that's how you can combine some selectors. And well, earlier we covered a style tag. So, but um, another way you can do it, and I think it's actually more common these days, is to put your CSS into a separate file and then link it in from there. So inside your head element, we will have a link uh, with the attribute of rel style sheet and type CSS. And then we will link href to this particular CSS file. And I think this particular set of slides should have yeah some CSS links. Um, they are not links locally, so uh, they are linked somewhere on the web where it should be a whole bunch of CSS. Yeah, like in this example, we are selecting a whole bunch of stuff, and at some point they are probably going to have the decoration box. Yeah, so I think um. It's more common to do it this uh, this way these days because um, you you get to group things into like specific files. Like in this example, um, I had some CSS for resetting everything, and then I had like some review CSS, which is the base for this set of slides, and then I had some theme, which made everything a uh, white light theme. So here's an example. Uh, well, I think we have time for a quick exercise. So uh, going back to this, uh, try styling it using an external style sheet. So 
uh, as a quick recap, we are able to create files here. So we can click in this new file to create a file, like maybe I'll call mine uh, styles.css. You could name it something else. And then we could specify like uh, several properties here. So um, now I didn't cover how to write, how, how to customize fonts. Um, in this screenshot, I'm using a font called Montserrat. Well, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, so if you like to try overriding the font as well by Googling yourself or checking out the documentation, you can give it a shot. Um, maybe we can have three minutes for this. It's kind of rushed, but yeah, then just, let's give it a try. Okay, I think I'll actually go through the solution now. So, well, well, a solution now. Uh, what I did uh, in this example was I created um, two classes, red and blue, where they simply have the decoration of red and blue inside for the color. And then I just applied these two classes. So you probably can tell that classes are very flexible. If I wanted, I could just like throw this class equals to red anywhere else, like maybe inside the heading one here, and it will apply to the first level heading. Yeah, but we can take a look at um, how I did it previously. So, um, ah, I guess I missed out on this. So, okay, let's talk about the fonts as well. Um, you can import a font from some URL. Um, I didn't cover this because I left it as an exercise to reader. And then I used the star selector to apply the font using the font family attribute to everything inside the document. So uh, in this example that I did earlier, what well, because I said, well, it, it's only a, one of the solutions, right? So in this solution, uh, I didn't create a red class. I applied the color red to level two headings directly. And uh, there were a bunch of styles like other styles like uh, making the font with bold, which I missed out on in my screenshot, but I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, just give me a second. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, let me stop sharing for a moment. Okay. Um, I think I'm accidentally annotating. So Okay, yeah, that's better. Sorry, let me pause the sharing for a moment uh, to read it on the chat. Um, this will be up to, this, this session is recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll announce the link in our chats uh, shortly. Yeah, 
Okay, let me resume sharing. Um, now, with CSS, we can have uh, combinators to select specific things, uh, more specific things actually. So for example, we can have X followed by space Y, and it will match uh, something that is a direct descendant. Let's see if I can kind of do this. Mm. Okay, X, Y, right? So let's say we wanted to select like um, the bullet. Um, yeah, the, the, the list items in an ordered list. So we could have like um, OL and then LI and well, let's try something different like background um, hot pink. And you can see that it's applied. Um, maybe that, that isn't such a great example. A body li. Now, um, this is selecting all the list elements that are inside the body. So it's pretty much selecting all the list elements inside this example. But if you wanted to have like direct descendants, for example, we could change it to um, this greater than sign and it will probably not select anything in this document because there's no list item that's directly inside a body. But if you change it to say an unordered list, um, it will only apply to the list items within this unordered list um, because well, the list items here are not direct descendants of an unordered list. Or we could match like, we could have a uh, tilde elements directly after. Um, what's a good example here? Um, H1, H2, P. Oh, sure, just for example, uh, H1, tilde, H2. I don't think there's any H2s that are direct. Oh, yeah, well, H2 comes after H1, right? Not, but it's not directly after. But if you change this to a plus, uh, it shouldn't apply to anything. Yeah, so if you change this to a P instead, because I think this paragraph comes after the H1, we could select that paragraph and it would have a hot pink background. Yeah. So these are ways you can um, you, you can uh, form more complex selections and do more complex styling if you need it. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to like diff and span, right? So we already established earlier that they don't have any semantic meaning. So but one way one very helpful thing is they can do is because they are just generic containers, right? We can have divs that have specific styles to apply to them. And also, well, IDs and classes are also very common ways to apply styling. In fact, I think classes are probably the way most people do styling these days. On top of that, you can also like have other selectors, like uh, for example, hover selector, focus selector. So say for hover, if you hover over something and then you, you, you could have like those styles applied to it. Um, we could have like the nth child. Uh, hmm, do I really want to go through this now? Okay, I, I don't think I want to go through this now because there's, it, it's pretty annoying. But you, you can read the documentation on them. So you could like select 10 children first, last, you could uh, negate. Uh, selector so you will select everything except for that particular selector like not p will be selecting everything other than p yeah yeah i don't think i will go through this yeah so you well, could apply the tables yeah yeah let's yeah, just skip this and yeah then let's just skip this uh you, you can try it on your own um, and you have the slides. Um, for this exercise, what I wanted to do was to go um, to let you apply like these specific selectors to this table such that when you hover over it, um, it will change the styling. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, with CSS, uh, we, we mentioned that the name of CSS is 
cascading style sheets, right? So what happens is like the styles that you apply kind of cascade through. So they kind of fall through into different elements. So when a property isn't specified, right? Um, the element will inherit from the parent or you have a particular default value. So for example, if um, you didn't specify the color for an element, um, it will inherit it from its parent, say, um, we had, say we specified UL to be called pink, right? Now, this bullet list will inherit like the hot pink background. Wait a minute, no, sorry, that's wrong. That's very wrong. Yeah, background isn't actually inherited. Color is inherited. So in this example, the list inherited uh, the hot pink color. You see that for this first bullet item, it's still it's still blue because um, blue the classes have a stronger specificity than like just the text selectors, and I'll be going through this really shortly. In fact, like right now, so CSS selectors have a specificity. So um, this is the least specific, and over here is the most specific. So Uh, we, we go in this order, like uh, the wildcard selector is the least specific. So everything else, pretty much everything else here will override whatever the wildcard selector specified. So for example, say I, I had a wildcard selector somewhere. Let's say um, my color should be green. So we didn't specify um, styles. So um, the wildcard selector pick up all this and turn it green. But for this, we had a class, and you see class is of a higher specificity than the wildcard. And also, um, uh, text, right? Sorry, elements uh, are less specific than classes. So we could have, and there are a whole bunch of these other rules. Uh, we could have, so let's try adding this. I think it's a wrong syntax. Yeah. Um, actually, let's select. Yeah. So, uh, important is pretty much the most specific selector. So, uh, it pretty much overwrote the styling for all the list items here. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, same thing. I don't think I'll go into too much detail about all this because, yeah, because it, it's kind of something that you can go through. And honestly, I don't think anyone would really remember all this if I went through them now. So, yeah. Okay, now we have done a lot of like very, very simple styling, right? So I, I have like applied font colors, so I did not apply font faces and whatnot, but I mentioned that HTML is supposed to mark out the content of your document, but it doesn't, it shouldn't determine how your page actually lays things up, right? So in this, Sorry, sorry, Zoom is giving some problems. Well, uh, let's see like this document. Um, your, your browser isn't, well, the HTML document wasn't the one that determined that like all these links up here would be up here. Uh, with uh, This sidebar here should end up here and the main document should be in this section over here, right? So, Uh, all of these were actually determined by CSS, this entire layout. And in fact, um, that, that is how it should be done um, with CSS determining the layout. And well, I mentioned that this particular, so 
HTML markup, CSS, the styling of the document, and JavaScript, the behavior. So as I was saying, uh, this set of slides is actually a HTML document, right? So we could actually disable all the styles and you could see that for this particular document, um, well, um, it's kind of a mess, but you could see like uh, without styling, this page looks kind of broken, but it's just like, it seems like a very plain document, right? With like paragraphs, um, yeah, some random image there. Uh, for some reason, it's all getting popular. And the CSS is actually like, what's giving this page, like uh, this styling where my selectors are, well, my headings are in the middle and everything else is in the middle and whatnot. So yeah, let's go into, let's cover like uh, layout with CSS. So uh, before that, let's talk about some CSS units. Um, there are some common units, like uh, when you specify some um, length in CSS, for example, the width, the height, uh, the margin and padding, which we talked about earlier, uh, you have to specify them with some kind of unit. So I remember, yeah, if you don't specify, it should default to P, uh, PX, which is uh, pixel. So which is around like, one arm 96 of an inch. Uh, we have a point, uh, which is this. Uh, we have this amps, uh, which is uh, relative to your font size. So for example, like if your default font size is um, say 10 and you have 1.2 M specified, it will be uh, font size 12 for that particular thing. So um, uh, there are many ways to control the layout with CSS. Uh, what I'm going to cover here for today is a grid. So um, let's talk about the intuition for grid first. So if you think about it, like let's say this page for example, I don't know if they're actually using grids here and I don't want to look at that strange marker again, but let's consider like if we were designing this page using grids, right? Can you like, can you imagine like, well, I can't annotate it as well. But can you imagine like drawing like lines over here such that this, oh, now I can. And somehow it's not displayed. I know so. And now it's actually okay. Fine. Somehow it's just lagging a lot. Yeah, can you imagine like you, you have some grid lines and then uh, you are laying things out here according to those grid lines. Uh, well, Zoom is not cooperating. Um. Asim, are you there? Yep, hi. Yeah, are you able to disable my annotations because this... The live transcript. Oh, your annotation. Oh. Yeah, 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 it's so annoying. Let me figure it out. Uh... Oh, um... I don't think I can clear annotations, so you can try to stop the screen share and restart it. I can't click stop screen share. Uh, how about this? I'll leave the... Uh, you've already stopped the screen share. Okay, uh, I guess I'll start the I'll restart the screen share. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that uh, hiccup. So yeah, well, if you were to Think about like this entire document as a grid, and then you, you, you could lay things out in the form of a grid, right? Uh, there are other ways to do it, like for example, a flex box where you define a box and then things squeeze inside that flex box. So it would be as though your CSS grid was one dimensional. And uh, this is actually the most common way to do it. Uh, well, maybe not the most common way, but this is the most popular way to do all this stuff. Uh, you use some massive. Uh, some popular CSS library, and then they come with their own uh, ways of laying out content that you can work with. 
um, the old way, the legacy way, which is still pretty common these days, is to float certain things. I won't be covering them uh, today. So let's talk about grids now. So let's consider like uh, this grid. Well, um, back to this page, right? If we were to think of it as a grid, uh, a really simple example, maybe like the top level navigation here would take up this portion of a grid. Uh, maybe your site could take up this portion and of course we get a lot of control over how much space uh, everything should take and maybe like the main content should could take up like these four grids so let's take a look at how to uh, use a grid so first you select some element like some container so uh, as we mentioned earlier like these are a great way for you to just create some random container then you can, you want to apply the property display grid to it to specify that uh, we'll be installing this using a grid. And for this temple, sorry, for this uh, particular grid, we are going to use a three by three grid, uh, meaning this particular grid. Uh. So um, we have the property grid template. Um, so we, I think rows come first. So we have one FR, one FR, one FR. So FR stands for fractional unit. Um, so um, we have a total of like three fractional units here together. So one FR is computed to be one third of uh, the, fra the fractional units for here. And similarly, we have like one FR, one FR for, for the columns here. So we should have an even grid. So it, we can adjust the fractions. Uh, which I'll demonstrate later. Oh yes, this uh, the rows come first, and after the slash, we have the columns. In this example, um, if you were to read uh, a grid tutorial online yourself, you'll see that this isn't the only way you can define a grid template. There are lots and lots of lots of ways you can do it. But uh, for the purpose of this workshop, I'll be focusing on just this grid template thing. But if you're exploring, keep in mind that this isn't the only way to do it, and the grid, well, grids are very flexible when it comes to how you want to define them. So now we have like a three by three grid, right? We can choose how we want to lay out certain things. So let me like give an example of how I could lay out this. Uh, bef before that, we need to talk about grid columns and lines. So uh, this will make more sense later, but for now, uh, we are talking about grids, right? And we, when we think of like, say, drawing things inside a grid, we, we draw things relative to like grid lines, right? So uh, let's ignore like the, the squares, the nine squares themselves. Let's focus on grid itself. So we have the grid lines. Think of it as, you, as if you are drawing some green color drawing board and you have all these green lines. So uh, in this example, well, this uh, uh, three by three square, we have four grid column lines, and we also have uh, four grid row lines. So when we lay out things later, we're going to reference them by the row and column lines. So we want, now here's an example. Well, here's this particular example, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, one takes up like the entire first column. Um, three takes up this tiny little square here. Uh, four takes up, four spans the third row, but over the second and third columns. So back to here. Um, box one will be on column one. And then now you see this index one slash four, grid row. That means box one spans from uh, row one to four. So uh, row lines, right? Uh, box one spans from row one all the way to row four. So that's how you can kind of view it. And simply, uh, for this, box two is on the third column and it spans from uh, grid row one to three. So, well, uh, the third column and row one, between one to three. So, uh, box two in that example would be from here to here. So, yeah, there's a starting line, ending line. Um, I think we have time for a quick exercise. So, um, this is slightly more involved. So if you want to, you can go, go to this link 
and um, try to copy the content here um, and paste it inside your code sandbox. And try to see if you can replicate. Uh, the layout of this site. So yeah, maybe we can have five minutes for this. Yeah, it shouldn't be. Yeah, it's a trickier one. So it could become involved. Uh, I've stopped the sharing temporarily. I'm trying to fix that Zoom issue. So, yeah.
Oh, sorry, I was muted. Okay. Yeah, um, I, wasn't talk I wasn't speaking anything for a while, but I started at 11.25. So uh, let, let me just repeat what I said earlier. So um, I asked you all to recreate this website if you wanted to give it a shot. Um, and the answer is uh, obviously inside here. Wait, just a quick check. Can, can you all hear me now? <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, we can kind of see that this also could form a tree by tree grid if you wanted to draw out the lines, right? Um, of course, this, uh, the second, yeah, you, you intuitively from the second row, you could kind of see that we could have another tree by tree grid. But the spacing is a little different. So um, for the first row and the last row, the footer, we could have a, we could have a, and well, they, they just take out the, uh, whatever content, they, they just take out enough space for whatever content they have inside. And um, the middle one just takes up most of the space. So um, in this example, instead of using like one fraction, one fraction, one fraction for the rows, we set the first and the third row to main content so that they'll just take up whatever space their content takes up. And we just throw in one fraction, um, which your browser will infer to just take up the rest of the space. Um, the columns here are still evenly divided. So we just keep it to one fraction, one fraction, one fraction. Well, for convenience, I threw in a max width so that it wouldn't take up the space of your entire page and keep it nice and small. And then this margin zero auto centers it. Uh, you might see margin zero auto a lot. It's a very convenient way to center things horizontally on your page. So from there, um, this takes up the entire first row. So, so you could kind of infer that this is going to take up the first, second, and third column. So for your head, it spans from the first grid row to the uh, first grid, the first row line sorry, first column line to the last column line. Similarly for the footer, it's the same thing, but it's in the third row and the first is in the first row. And then we have the same for each of these uh, boxes inside the grid. So that's that. Uh, one fun fact is um, if this was, I think the 1990s, this would have been considered a very great, beautiful website uh, because it has like a, a nice header, a nice footer, a nice a side here, and main content over here. But we're no longer in the 1990s. Okay, so I guess I've covered uh, most of the, uh, well, uh, a really brief introduction to HTML and CSS, right? Um, Hacker School usually just touch, touches the tip of the iceberg and encourages you to explore from there. That's why there's links for uh, to, uh, to all the documentation for you to explore if necessary. But you're probably wondering, well, I have the basics, but what else can I learn from here? What should I learn from here? So there's some things that you could consider learning from here. So in this workshop, we covered um, HTML and CSS. But nowadays, it's actually pretty rare to write HTML by hand when you are developing an entire complex application. So, um, well, let's talk about a more complex application. Um, if you were doing some like personal page, uh, like just to display some um, content that doesn't change, static content, like um, say your personal page uh, to introduce yourself, uh, put your maybe your portfolio there, then you might write HTML by hand. But if you are developing a complex dynamic application, say Facebook, or say in this example, um, well, I hope I don't have. Okay, let me just show NUS mods. If you're doing some complex application where you have some uh, behavior, like for example, you're able to have this timetable where you can move things around, or maybe a luminous application where you can display all sorts of dynamic content, like for example, some modules that I'm taking and whatnot. You, you don't really write all this HTML by hand. You use JavaScript libraries. So what these libraries do is they allow you to dynamically uh, manipulate your HTML. So as an example, this could, well, this could form like an unordered list of modules I'm taking, right? And this unordered list of modules was dynamically populated by JavaScript, which uh, requested it from some kind of server. Uh, 
So there's a lot of JavaScript libraries out there that help you write uh, complex applications like this. Um, nowadays, a lot of them like to break things out into components, which um, form a, a logical component. So for example, um, in this example, this uh, card right could, might be composed of a div and you could think of this as a module component that consists of like the module code, um, the module name, um, the semester, and the professor who is in charge of this module. So you could break things down into components, like for example, this could be a navigation component, but inside this navigation component, you have other components like um, your nav navigation links, uh, maybe like a profile component and whatnot. So uh, one of the very popular ones is uh, React. Um, there will be a React workshop next week um, if you're interested in learning React. So um, this isn't a React workshop, but let me just kind of, so give a high level idea of what React could be like. So uh, you write JavaScript. JavaScript is a programming language. Um, so in this example, you could write a function called an app um, and it returns something that's, that looks like this. So it, the stuff here, kind of looks like HTML, right? Like, in fact, most of this is something we have covered earlier today, like this header, image, paragraphs. But inside this, we have um, other interesting syntax, like for example, um, source for the image is some curly brace and whatnot. So this isn't actually HTML, it's JavaScript that, well, it, well uh, this part is actually stuff that gets translated to JavaScript. And from there, the JavaScript generates uh, the corresponding HTML dynamically. So if you're interested in like learning React and building a more interactive applications, because what we covered today is really static content, right? Then um, yeah, check out the React workshop next week, 16 October. Uh, a lot of what you learn with HTML is really experimenting. Say you had an idea of something you want, to, no, I didn't want to do that. Say so you had an idea of something you wanted to build um, in HTML. And what do you do? Uh, one very one way that really worked out for me was I, I try to copy, but I, I look at what other sites are doing. So for example, let's say I wanted to figure out uh, how to build a component like this, right? I could open my inspector, try to select this, and I see that this forms a, well, um, they decided to use a, an anchor for this. And then I'm able to inspect all the styles here. Let me zoom in slightly. Yeah, I'm able to inspect all the styles here. So I could, and from there, uh, I could discover other HTML, uh, CSS properties, uh, box shadow. I could play around with them. So let's say just unchecking it here. But, you can't see like the box shadow disappearing, right? Uh, maybe the border radius, it's not very obvious here. Yeah, and I could just play around with things. So maybe let me just crank this border radius to something ridiculous. Yeah, um, that looks terrible. <laughs> and yeah, so experimenting with things is a great way to, <laughs> yeah, figure out like what, what, what each thing does, uh, the properties of everything and whatnot, yeah. So it looks cursed. Yeah, so experimenting was one way that really helped me out when I first got started with HTML. Um, and of course, after experimenting, I uh, along the way, I went to MDN and, and tried to read up, oh, why, why, why is this, like, why is this change doing this thing? Uh, if you wanted to play with CSS, um, there are really fantastic CSS libraries out there that um, say, I think Tailwind is a rather popular one these days. Let's see. Um, so, yeah, um, Azim, you are, a web, you are a web developer, right? Do you have yes. any recommendations you would like to share with our attendees? to CSS frameworks, is it? Well, not just CSS, right? Um, let me, sorry, no, let me cover Tailwind first. And then sure, sure. if you have any advice, yeah, just feel free to offer them. Sure, sure. So, yeah, this is like a pretty modern CSS library. Uh, it's class-based, so they have a whole bunch of classes and then you can just apply these classes 
to whatever you want to do. So like applying, uh, have a class called PG Rate 50. Well, they have a whole bunch of classes and you can just throw these classes into your element and throw and throw and throw and throw and that, throw them. Mm. Yeah, and from there, you are able to build a, say, like this complex component, which looks like what you could see on a modern e-commerce site and whatnot. So yeah, check out Tailwind. Uh, I linked several others as well. Uh, Bootstrap, a really classic one made by Twitter. It was a really hot thing back then. I think it's still popular these days. Yeah, and uh, it comes with a lot of uh, uh, useful CSS, useful CSS for you to be able to do things like layout, uh, containers, uh, apply things to forms. Uh, we didn't cover forms today because this is an introduction, but we have forms and then you can make your form look like this instead of looking like some, um, looking crappy. Yeah, maybe you could try designing your own personal page and do a, do a portfolio. And if you wanted to try building something more complex, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, check out the React workshop. So with that, uh, we have kind of come to the end of this workshop. Uh, I'll be staying around for questions. Yeah, so if you have any questions, just feel free to drop them in the chat and whatnot. If not, uh, I think that's the end. Yeah. Uh, if you would like to stick around, one thing that I, yeah, I considered covering uh, deploying a website to somewhere. Like for example, as uh, this set of slides is, uh, uh, this, this set of slides is a uh, HTML document, right? But I'm not sure if I will be able to cover that within this time frame. So yeah, I think this is the end, and I'm sticking around for questions. Yeah. yeah, maybe um later on we can just update the slides and add on um like a link to a simple deployment guide or something. A link to what? A simple guide on how to do deployment. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. If not, yeah. Uh yeah. Feel free to stick around for questions. Um Azim, actually Azim, do you have any advice for them as well? Because you are a web developer, right? Um, so I would say that. I mean, primarily you learn by doing. So go and create your own things, as you mentioned, um, and explore explore doing it yourself before you you chuck in a CSS framework, so you understand what the framework is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and and then after that, I guess you slowly just progress on to, to things like uh, React or Vue or whatever to help mm -hmm. you better understand uh, how to build these things. Up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Like, yeah. Hands on is probably like the nicest way to uh, under well not understand uh to to get a feel of HTML and CSS. You probably understand it by now. I I hope so because that was one of my goals with this workshop. But there's so much things I haven't covered. Like I haven't covered like embedding videos. Haven't well, yeah. This uh rich content. Like say let's say say Google Docs, right? Uh Google Docs is something pretty complex. Uh how how did Google build Google Docs, right? So back then it used to be well back then a Google document used to be a HTML document as well that was built with a lot of JavaScript. But I think they've since progressed to using a canvas. Right? So you, you can't like manipulate this. As though it was like a, a, a like a HTML page really anymore because it's inside a canvas. So there's a lot of these things. Uh, you, yeah, you could build entire games in HTML inside this canvas and whatnot. Uh, is that a question? Yeah, but yeah, that's, that's it. So yeah, that's the end. I think you can stop recording, Azim. <laughs>